I'm Reverend Phil, and I'm your host for Words of the Prophets. Where are our prophets now? Where are those messengers God chooses to communicate divine revelation through? In the past, the Creator has sent prophets like Abraham, Siddhartha, Jesus, Mohammed, and many more. Maybe our higher power has switched tactics since we reinterpret God's words as soon as the Creator's prophets leave us. Could it be that Spirit talks to each one of us individually and we haven't learned to listen? On Words of the Prophets, our modern prophets show us how to find the internal prophet that is the I Am, and we discuss the application of spiritual principles in all aspects of our lives. Love and light, everybody. I'm Reverend Phil, and I'm your host for Words of the Prophets. Today, my guest is Allison Martinez, who is a member of the South Santa Fe Quaker Worship Group. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. Thank you for being here with me. And today's prophetic topic is love one another. And we're going to talk about this phrase because this phrase was not an accident. This phrase can be found in the Gospel according to St. John, the King James Version, chapter 5, verses 15 to 17, and they read as follows. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, that ye love one another." And one of the more powerful statements in the Gospels, we're going to talk about why we chose this. But before we get to that, Allison is a member. They don't, I'll let you tell it. Yes. How did you, you know, we'll get into what is Quakerism. And, but how does a person, what path led you to become a Quaker? Well, I had been a Unitarian because I thought that was all I qualified for. I, qualified for? Yes, because most religions have a list of things <coughs> that you have to believe, and the Unitarians don't really insist. And I wasn't sure about some of the things that one is supposed to believe. But uh, the clerk of the Quaker meeting here in Santa Fe came to speak to us one Sunday, just because Quakers and Unitarians are friends, often side by side. And he, after explaining a little bit, said, why don't you come? Find out. So I did. And I couldn't go back. Because there, I, I felt God. And that is the central fact of the Quaker faith, that there is a place inside each person that God can touch, a place where you can experience God. And that experience, which is hard to deny when you've had it, that experience teaches you that everyone else is like that, too. That there is God inside every person. So that changes your whole life. And I couldn't go back. The Unitarians are wonderful people, but I couldn't go back. So you talk about this message that you've heard, and it resonated. No, it's not the words that you've heard, because every church in America says words to this effect. But the Quaker method of worship makes it a routine experience. Perfectly ordinary people uh, can be sure that it will happen at least sometimes. Because it's a method. It's an experimental method. Can you elaborate? What do you mean by experimental? It takes two or three people you can't do it by yourself, although, of course, you can pray and be in touch with God. But the Quaker worship, you have to have at least two or three people who meet quietly and wait for God to appear, which he does. Now, I, I must apologize uh, 
for speaking of God as a person, uh, this is my limitation. I know that many people are able to speak more abstractly that God is a spirit, and, and they are more correct. But because of my personal limitations, I tend to think of him as a person. That brings forth an interesting question. If the divine is within each one of us, how could we have limitations? <laughs> um, talk about this process a little bit. All more. right. Well, again, it is mentioned in the Gospels where uh, Jesus says that uh, wherever two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. All I can say is uh, that if you wait with the silent expectation, the readiness and the open hearts, but together, not one person meditating. Now, some people think that it's meditation, but it's, it's more of a group thing. You open your heart to the individuals you are with as well as the potential of spiritual, of, of the spirit touching each of you and all of you. And it happens. So you're not in a meditation. You're Not just, really. Are you making eye contact? Are you holding you hands? Or? No, you don't hold hands. You might have eye contact, but usually most people have their eyes shut most of the time. But your focus is outward towards the others, Among, where meditation yes, would be inward. Exactly. Now, there are people who attend our meetings, and they meditate inwardly, and it's good to have them there. But the fullest experience is that open-hearted experience. Okay, that's a good way to distinguish it. Um, you talked about the Unitarians and other religions having beliefs that you had to be able to comply with. So are you saying that there are no beliefs you have to comply with in Quakers? Only or? that one. You have to trust and if possible act upon the belief the knowledge, the knowledge that there is the potential of God in each person. There is that of God in every person is the way we usually express it. It's not to be a, um, a, a, a series of words to which you assent. It is an experience that you are less and less able to deny. As you experience it over and over, the reality becomes stronger and stronger until you can't deny it. And then out of that come your behaviors. If God is there in your, behind your eyes, how could I knowingly harm you? How could I not respect you? Out of that belief come the worldly testimonies, the actions of peace, justice, equality, community. All of those things come out of the mystical experience. Doesn't, uh, I want to get into those qualities, yeah. but before we yeah. even get there, yeah. isn't that asking a lot of somebody to start with to come in and to believe that they are divine? I mean, that's contrary to what not what the prophets have taught us, but what the religions have teaching us. Maybe what religions have te taught us, but not what the great yeah. gurus teach. Exactly. Especially Jesus, who says over and over, the kingdom of God is within you. But we don't seem to pay attention to that much. So, I mean, that, was that your experience, or can you share somebody's? I mean, the first it seems to be like a, a kind of learning curve, I guess, is the yes, best way. Yes, yes. Uh, my experience, I was very fortunate because the very first time I attended meeting, I, I experienced the most basic part of it, the presence of God. And years passed of attending meeting uh, without really 
being aware of my spiritual growth, but uh, it happens. Can you flesh out, it's kind of like contradiction in terms, having that touch, that, that spirit touch you, how does, how, how did that come to you the first time? It's just like, oh, I, I've got to go there. Next Sunday I can do it again. I've got to do it again. So you just had this feeling that was unlike anything you've ever had before. Right. Yes. And as you keep coming back, it grows. Yes, the feeling doesn't, you don't always have that strong mystical experience. But uh, you also, you're with other people that develops a community. These are people who are contacting each other at the most basic human level. Uh, and so it's a deeper kind of community. It, it grows from eating together and chatting together and helping each other in practical ways. Uh, that's part of it. Uh, and then there's, as you go, f as you persist, persist is all it takes, just doing it over and over, the meaning of things becomes more obvious and irresistible. And that is why we have, for example, uh, people who refuse to serve in the armed services. The underlying meaning of armed service becomes impossible. Well, love one another. You cannot do that if you're armed right. uh, with intention. Um, I, I want to back this up again yeah. because I'm just, as you're talking, more and more questions are coming. I am part of a group process. It's a 12-step group. Uh-huh. And I've seen the dynamic where, and obviously a lot of people coming in the 12-step group are probably in a lot worse shape than yeah. people showing up at a Quaker meeting. But, I mean, in, in this group process, is there the possibility, is there the experience that somebody's energy can have a detrimental effect on the group, distracting effect on the group, or...? Uh, Maybe detrimental is too strong a well, word. Well, no, but yes, it, it does happen sometimes, but the loving power of the group has always been stronger as far as I've seen. The complete lovingness of it. Okay. What is T-O-G-I-E-P? That's the that of God in every person. Uh, that we've been talking about. Uh, and more than what we've said, I can't really say. Uh, but... I had to write that down. <laughs> um, you have uh, six, six things listed here. The first one was peace. Yes. Um, I'm assuming that the sequence is... is, is no, the sequence is, is not... N yes, okay. it's not meaningful. All of these things, uh, justice, uh, the respect for the earth. Uh, now, that's a little bit more indirect because the living things on the earth need us to respect earth. Uh, we... We also, the, the Creator, of course, we show our respect for the Creator, too, when we try to be moderate in our demands on God's creation. But most of the Are points, you a vegetarian? Uh, I've become a bit more bit vegetarian-ish. Okay, I was just curious <laughs> what you were saying. Yes, I, I can't quite bear the thought of killing the animals. But... Uh, the, the direct things like peace were famous for not being soldiers. And yet, when William Penn, who was uh, 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 of the uh, knightly class in England, asked George Fox about carrying the sword, George Fox said, carry it as long as you can. George Fox was the first Quaker. And so we don't say to someone, well, you can't do that because 
it, it, it's not Quakerly. We confidently expect, based on our experience, that as they go further, as they continue to seek God's presence, some of these behaviors will drop away. The transformative effect of the divine. Yes, yes. How beautiful. So peace is a demonstration of that. Yes. You know, uh, equality is a demonstration yes. that we're all equal. Yes, and of course, Quakers were among the first to allow women to speak uh, in church, in meeting. Uh, right from the beginning, uh, George Fox and Margaret Fell were partners in the creation of the Quaker uh, of fellowship, the Religious Society of Friends, as we call it. Friends of truth, friends of Jesus, as the quotation that you began with, friends of each other, friends of the light, all of those ideas in the word friends. It's about seeing what we were talking about off camera before we started, which was if you don't see God in all, you don't see God at all. Yes. So there's yes. a way we treat somebody when we see that there are equal, there are divine. Right. So tell me about simplicity. How, how yes. simple does simplicity get? Simplicity is a really great concept for right now in America. Uh, because some of us have been forced uh, to radically drop, our, our jobs have dropped us, and we have to really drop a lot of our possessions, our ideas about how we uh, behave in the material world. Simplicity is the simple mind of the child. Remember, uh, you have to become as a child before you can really meet God. The child trusts with a simple-mindedness that what is needed will be provided, that guidance is available, that he will learn more and grow more day by day. Isn't That's that a the child. first beatitude? Uh, Perhaps. I, I remember. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's a very similar idea. There's another the, place where Jesus particularly says, bring me a child. This is a child. You have to be like a child. And the meek is basically, I think, you know, that the, I don't want to call it the hidden definition, but the yes. ancient definition as opposed to, like, now people... You kind of define meek as you know some kind self -abasing of self-abasing. No. Yeah, exactly. It's about no attachment to, to the ego. Right. Was the meek was yes. yes yes. And that's when you was talking about simplicity. It, it just sounded so much like the definition yes. or the ex explanation of that. I, th I believe it's the first beatitude. Simplicity manifests in not having things you don't need, not doing things you really don't have time for. Uh, it, it manifests in looking people in the eye and greeting them as equals. That's related to equality. A simplicity is not expecting that you can plan very far ahead, but being ready to step, take the step, as soon as that one step is revealed. There was a beautiful definition of faith that I'd gotten in the 12 steps. Mm. Faith is not leaping from point A to point B. Faith is leaping from point A. Oh, yes. Great. It sounds yes. like what you're saying. Yes, yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that lack of attachment, again, I mean, you're touching on the few quotes I know from the Bible. <laughs> but uh, it's the easier quotes. for a camel to get through the eye of the needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. It's Again, it's about those attachments. Yes, the right. Possessions don't make me. It's what's inside that makes me. That's yes. the peace the equality and all the other stuff that yeah. we're... We don't remember Gandhi for his possessions. Nope. Or Jesus either. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head, he told others. Uh, it is necessary to drop possessions. And I'm not saying that people who have lost their job 
uh, should bless that fact by no means. I don't want to say that anyone is blessed to lose their livelihood. But some people have actually had more than what they needed, and they will find blessing in simplicity if they are willing to find blessing there. If they're willing to trust that God is in every person, including themselves, then they'll yes. be taken care of. Yes. Exactly. Yes. How beautiful. So we've been talking about all these quotes from the Bible. So the question is, is the Bible part of the, the Quaker practice ceremony which uh, separate from... No, there is no requirement to believe in the Bible. I do. Most Quakers do. The original Quakers all did because they were uh, 17th century Englishmen and the, the Bible was the religious book that they knew. Uh, we don't believe that God stopped talking to people with the Bible. And we also emphasize that it is good to try to read the Bible in the original spirit, the spirit with which it was given. Uh, we try not to read the Bible with a, 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 a rigid, uh, earthbound uh, outlook, but we try to read it with a loving, light-filled spirit. And if something in the Bible seems um, not full of love, we pause and read it again later. The, uh, but we also continue to find God's spirit in Buddhist writings, Hindu writings, uh, Muslim writings, the writings of people with no uh, definite religion, but they are making an effort to communicate what spirit has given. So let me, let's back this up for a second. Is there such a thing as a, and I guess the term is service, is there such a thing as a typical service? And what does it look like? <laughs> it looks like a bunch of people sitting in a circle. In fact, uh, a Quaker child is uh, known to have said, Mommy, when everybody wakes up, will we have cookies? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the reading is not part of the service, so to speak? Is not service the right term? Uh, worship service is, is a good term. Worship, we usually say meeting for worship. Okay, so reading is not part of it? Not usually. So if I show up, uh, it's on Sundays, correct? Yes. So I show up on Sunday, Yeah. what happens? Uh, you walk into a room and sit, choose a chair and sit there and there's a long silence. And you settle into the sweetness of the silence. And then after a little while, you start to wonder if anything's going to happen. And perhaps nothing at all happens. The hour ends, everyone holds hands. But perhaps during the hour, uh, some people are, are led to uh, share uh, a message. Uh, the leading <coughs> comes within. Not every uh, message that comes to you is meant to be shared, but sometimes there is a feeling that you should speak. For me, that comes as kind of a hot energy. Others get it in other ways, but they know they, they must feel it speak. Differently. Yes, they know they should speak, so they will stand and speak as best they can put into words what they are supposed to say, and then they sit down. And we wait for that message to settle into everyone's thoughts. There may be additional messages, perhaps someone will sing, someone may pray. Someone may even flip open their Bible and read a passage, but not by having planned that, only if the Spirit tells them now. 
so they could they could they could have their Bible with them. And you mentioned other religions. So yeah, could somebody show up uh, at, at the at a Quaker meeting with a copy of the Upanishads, for instance? Absolutely, and and uh, as long as it as long as they waited for that inward prompting, uh, then their reading or message would be most welcome. Each person contributes, sometimes only by their presence, but only by their presence is a weak thing to say, because it is their presence that makes it a meeting for worship. So, that guess brings me to the next question, which is, we talk a lot about the Bible, but we're also talking about other books. Is does Quaker consider themselves a Christian denomination? Do they consider themselves an independent religion? How do they see themselves? Well, we definitely started as a as a Christian group in the 17th century in England. Uh, some Quakers Is this now an offshoot of the Church of England. Uh, it was part of the. A uh, large group of dissenters from the church. Okay. Uh, there were ranters and levelers and Puritans and uh, Baptists uh, and Quakers. Uh, we nowadays, you will definitely hear people say, "Well, are we Christian?" And we certainly welcome people of other backgrounds. But I myself am deeply Christian, and I keep referring back to that 17th century uh, root. So, are you so kind of saying that there are subsects of Quakerism? So no, we all worship together in the. Uh, I'm not within your congregation, but I mean yes. different congregations can approach differently. Well, there are definitely some that would not welcome people of other faith backgrounds. But in our worship group, we have uh, one person of a native religion and some others that I don't think are Christian, though they haven't really spoken about that. I, I, that's, I find that curious. I mean, if this equality is one of the mainstays of the belief structure. How could we not accept somebody? Well, that's how I feel. But uh, certainly there are groups that are more self-consciously and definitely Christian. And they might expect everyone to say, well, everyone has an equal opportunity to be Christian. But uh, again, to me, that is not so important as my personal responsibility to be true to God. Which is what we're all here for. Yeah, right. So, you know, you're here speaking, um, so let me ask the question, does Quaker have a hierarchy? Does Quaker have pastors, ministers? Um, Some do. Uh, there's a, a worldwide movement. There's a lot of Quakers in Africa, quite a lot in Bolivia and Mexico. Uh, of course, the group started in England, and we have them a lot in the United States. But uh, since there's so much emphasis on the individual revelation, there's a tendency to splinter and have different takes on it. Uh, and we do come together in worldwide uh, unity, but in the United States there are friends' churches that employ a minister, uh, and some of them have sermons and hymns and only a short period of uh, what I call worship. Which is uh, just a quiet time. Yes, right. Uh, all of these people are part of the larger fellowship. Now, the, uh, the building block of all of these Quaker groups is the monthly meeting, as it's called, which is a group that meets once a month uh, to handle 
uh, things like marriages and, uh, and, you know, admission to the fellowship and all kinds of spiritual business, so to speak. Uh, and we have one in Santa Fe. Our worship group is under care of that uh, meeting. You say admissions. What does one have to do to be admitted? Um, well, you basically just have to say you would like to be, and then you have to explain that you believe there is that of God in every person. And uh, when you are sincere, then you can become a Quaker. You are a Quaker uh, when a meeting admits you. How does it, it one is not, judge one's sincerity? It, it, it's obvious. It, it's not... Okay. Uh, you know, it's not a rigorous thing as some, but it's extremely rigorous as you go forward and you are challenged over and over to do what you believe. Okay. I want to take a quick moment here. Um, I've got yeah. PSA to read, and then we're going to come right back. But Fine. Just stay right, right there. Um, this is uh, about Unity Santa Fe, the church up on the hill by overlooking the northern, I guess it's the northern part of 599, up where 599 meets uh, St. Francis. So Tuesday, September 8th, and Wednesday, September 9th, is 6.30 to 8.30, is going to be an interfaith workshop and dialogue, which will consist of 45 minutes of learning about a particular faith's path for peace and 45 minutes of a faith's path for prayer and meditation practices. So Tuesday, September 8th, will be Catholic, and Wednesday, September 9th, will be Sufi. Um, also on Wednesday, September 9th, through Thursday, September 10th, is going to be reach out, reach in, reach out. We can change the world. It's a unity world of prayer, and there's going to be prayer vigils going on. Um, they need volunteers, and if you want to participate, you want to volunteer, you want to learn more about it, contact Unity at 989-4433. That's 989-4433. Unity is a wonderful group. They have prayed uh, for causes where I asked them to pray, and their prayers work. Brendan was on three weeks ago, uh -huh. four weeks ago tops yeah. as my guest. Oh, they're, they're fabulous. Do we yes. have time to tell about how I was challenged uh, with my leading? Go for it. <laughs> of course. Uh, We've got plenty of time. Okay, because it was about, let's see, uh, 2007, that I began to be concerned about the limitations of the little meeting house on Canyon Road. And I became more and more troubled about it and started thinking of alternatives, but at the same time I'm thinking, why is this, you know, coming to my mind? So I asked the meeting for a clearness committee. This is where we believe that we can help each other discern the truth because we each have that of God within. So meeting provided for me a small group who helped me think and talk and pray about this matter of an additional, as it began to be, an additional worship space. And they said, yes, this is a true leading, which is to say God has tapped you on the shoulder. I said to myself, well, to them I said, thank you. <laughs> to myself I said, why me? I have why no time. Why not you? <laughs> Well, and the answer that kept coming to me is, well, I asked everybody else, you're my last choice. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, the Clearness Committee had urged me to work with others, so I called a, an organizational meeting at the South Side Library, and we decided that 
an additional worship space was needed because the space on Canyon Road was just too crowded. And it should be, you know, accessible. Um, it should be on the bus line and, and you know. How uh, many members are to kind of make up the congregation on, on Canyon Road? Well, about a hundred enrolled members. And uh, it's, a, it's an old farmhouse uh, with a small meeting room. If more than 50 people show up, there is not space. There is just not space. So I, uh, uh, so the, the group said, this is what we need. And I started looking and looking. And the first place we found, the Center for the Natsra team on uh, uh, Vegas Verdes let us meet there. So that was on the south side, you see, where more people live, because not many people live up near Canyon Road anymore. And, uh, you know, it was on the bus line. It had wheelchair access. It had everything we needed. Uh, then for a while, we met in a little rented room over at the uh, International Institute of Oriental Medicine. And then all of a sudden, we received some large donations and we were thinking of maybe buying something, but it was, we were led more, we have leased a place that people just love. It's in a green building, as they call it, you know, uh -huh. with uh, water saving features and so on, uh, on the uh, short end of Camino Carlos Rey, where Camino Carlos Rey crosses uh, Cerrillos Road, there's a little short northwest end, and that's where we are. And uh, so it's on the top story. There's beautiful views of the mountains. There's plenty of space. It's a comfortable air, uh, area, and people just love to meet there. And then we found that other groups that work on our issues, uh, NAACP has well, not them, but another, another um, African American function was held there. Um, you know, various green and mm -hmm. um, e equality-minded groups. So that's that's a wonderful place. We love being there. It totally amazed me how this thing went step by step. It was about a year after we started meeting that we found ourselves in this new space. So when way opens, uh, that's a Quaker phrase, way opens. That is, you take one step and another door opens and another door opens. Sometimes it can happen really fast, <laughs> as long yeah. as you aren't holding back. You mentioned donations. How does, I mean, is it self-supporting with its own contributions, so to speak? How, how does... Well, how does, uh, that, how does that work? Right now, we aren't short of money at our worship group. We have the money we need. Uh, that's kind of so. If somebody shows up, that is not a basket passed every week or anything. No, like but that. we gratefully accept donations, and that is that definitely helps keep us afloat. Uh, th but money is is not the problem. Uh, what has happened is that people have come. And we have found that they have the right gifts. They know how to do whatever is the next thing we need to do. Just believe and it gets presented. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Getting out of the way and letting God's grace touch us. That's exactly how it feels. And uh, there's a good reminder in the Old Testament about manna, how... Uh, Wandering in the desert, the Jews were fed. They were fed exactly the amount that they needed. If they tried to get extra and save it for <laughs> for tomorrow, it rotted. Yeah. <laughs> it's about faith. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's about letting that internal connect with the external and let it all happen. Letting it happen, right. The thing that's hard for people in most religions is that somebody will tell them about this and say, okay, now, you have to have faith in this. You have to believe it, even though it's not logical. 
And uh, if you don't, you're in trouble, and if you do, everything will be great. Well, having that kind of faith is is really almost not possible unless you have the experience. So the beautiful thing is that if you're just willing to try, we aren't the only group that can give you that experience. Uh, There are a number of paths that will let people experience the Godhead but we're one that's conveniently available at 1730 Camino Carlos Rey. Excellent. <laughs> and at the end of the show, I'll give you a chance to just kind yes. of to put that out there. Yeah. Um, how about a little history? Yes. Uh, the Quaker path was discovered, I would like to say, by George Fox, uh, who was a Christian in 17th century England. England had not yet ended a century of brutal wars, uh, torturing people over questions of faith. You know, one year you're supposed to believe that the body and blood of Christ is actually in the communion wafer. Uh, The next year you can get in big trouble for believing that. he, he was a, a man of conscience. He was greatly troubled. He went around asking different priests. Uh, he got nowhere with it. Uh, one said, why don't you smoke a, smoke a pipe of tobacco? That'll settle your mind. Ah. Yes, and here he is talking about the ultimate meaning of life. And then he found some level of understanding that he was able to present to others. So, in 1647, he began preaching, and many people uh, were thrilled to hear this word of, at once, liberation and commitment. I mean, I know that everything we get is divine. Yes. But did he attribute any of this to any particular singular event, you know? Really, he, you know, like, I'm not saying like a burning bush, but like a burning bush. You know what I'm yes, saying? Yes. He was, uh, he perceived an ocean of darkness, an ocean of darkness. The evil that the people in the 12-step programs have dipped their toes into. And then he saw rolling over it a wonderful ocean of light. Mm -hmm. And he understood that there is, he heard, as it were, an inward voice, there is one who can speak to your condition, and that is Christ Jesus. Well, he began praying and showing people how to understand this, how to experience it. But there's a certain amount of anarchy in this. (laughs) Uh, He... uh, Uh, He partnered up with Margaret Fell, who was at that time uh, the wife of a justice, of a judge. And uh, she became like the the practical center. She wrote letters to different groups around and um, kind of kept the thing organized. Uh, After some years, after some oh, ten years or so after her husband died, uh, the widow uh, fell, uh, married George Fox. But they spent very little time together as a married couple. Uh, They were absorbed in the work of letting the world know about this. And so uh, the, the roots are in 17th century English Christianity, uh, and the, the network, as I would say, a network is the best way to describe it, of monthly meetings all around the world. You talked about this ocean of light mm-hmm. and this darkness. Does that 
imply duality? Mm, no. Uh, the darkness is hard to understand, but the light is what we are able to understand. Uh, and the darkness is without power against the light. The light is overwhelmingly greater. It's not like a Manichaean dualism. Okay. I was just curious. Cause right. That's, you know, that's, that's right. But we all know that there are dark times and dark experiences and people who um, are, are dark. There's an interesting story. Um, it's attributed to early in Einstein, like when he was in mm -hmm. college. Yeah. And he was in a, I forget what kind of class he was taking. I don't know if it was a physics class or it was a philosophy class. And they were talking about evil. Mm. And so Einstein pops up and says, well, is there such a thing as cold? Can, is there something that generates cold? Or is cold the yes. absence yes. of warmth? Right. And the, the sort of professor, yeah, there's, you know, nothing generates cold. Cold is the absence of warmth. Then he goes, is there such a thing as, is darkness, or is darkness the absence of light? And he was like, okay, yeah, there's no such thing as darkness. There's, you know, it's the absence of light. Nothing generates darkness. And then he goes on to say, okay, well, then there, is there really such a thing as evil, or is evil just a word we use for the absence of spirit? Very, very, very good analogy. Uh, and also a simple analogy. Einstein was brilliantly, powerfully simple-minded. Uh-huh. That's simplicity. Yes. Yes. Definitely. Yes. yes. So when Quakerism was founded, did it meet resistance from the establishment? Oh, yes, because uh, a lot of that resistance came out of this equality business. And I guess that issue has not been totally laid to rest in humanity even today. But uh, Quakers would not treat uh, the upper class as the upper class was accustomed to be treating, treated. Uh, we tend to look people in the eye, whether they are big shots or not. And uh, men wouldn't take off their hats, women wouldn't cur curtsy, and everybody was called by the familiar thee and thou. Uh, it's analogous to calling everybody by first names today. So uh, that put people's back up, and then when they started trying to preach at the end of the sermon. It was uh, customary in uh, Protestant churches in England at that time. At the end of the service, the people attending were free to speak, but the things that the Quakers said were very upsetting. And uh, routinely, uh, people were thrown out of church, beaten up, uh, pelted with dirt, uh, thrown into jail. Uh, George Fox's health was ruined by the many harsh imprisonments that he he suffered uh, for usually for seeming disrespectful uh, for refusing to take oaths uh, we don't o uh, t say oaths we affirm and that's biblical uh, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay uh, don't swear on uh, the uh, don't swear on the temple. You can't, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's yeah. a place, uh, but we do it out of truthfulness because we try to make every word we say truthful, whether we're on oath under affirmation or just speaking to another person about an ordinary matter. Uh, so all that led to great persecutions. Uh, in Boston, two Quaker women had crossed the ocean to, um, to speak about the Quaker truth to the Puritans in Boston. Mary Dyer and I've forgotten the name of her companion, uh, they were both hanged. 
on Boston Common. But we so. don't like truth in this culture, do really. <laughs> Nobody culture. has ever liked truth except those who find it's joyous. The truth shall make you free. And when you feel that truth glowing inside you, the truth that God is touching you, you feel so much joy that you want to share it with everyone. But of course, then well, it tends to upset the way things are supposed to be. I was going to say, the whole statement is the truth will upset you before it sets you free. <laughs> Some people just get stuck in the upset part and never get set free. Yes, yes, yes. We're going to start to run down in some time, so I want to give you an opportunity to give out some contact information, Great. either personally or for the, the group. Well, thank you. Uh, you can come to our worship service at 1030 any Sunday in the red, kind of a rust red building at 1730 Camino Carlos Rey. Uh, you can call us at 471-2288. Or you can email us at ssfqwg at cybermesa.com. That stands for South Santa Fe Quaker Worship Group. We'd okay. love to hear from you. Excellent. And that's going to be flashing on it. Probably has been flashing on the screen. So people want to get a hold of you. It's a beautiful experience. Yes. It's a, you know, one of the few religions I really believe that walk their talk has a real social consciousness i invite everybody to check it out i, I need to get into some announcements but i wanted to ask this and i want to run out of time so i'd rather run short on announcements um how do we get from the religious society of friends to quakers oh because we quake and that can happen sometimes people shake with the feeling sometimes they weep with the poignancy and that's how the word Quakers came into existence. We quake before the power. Okay. A couple of announcements. One, um, there is going to be on the plaza on September 19th a six-hour recovery week celebration. There is going to be live music, food. It's going to be speakers, it's going to be information booths, it's being sponsored by the Santa Fe Recovery Center, and it's about letting the community know what resources are available for any and all aspects of any family that is touched by substance abuse, alcoholism, drug addiction. So come on down, enjoy the music, get to know what resources are there for you. You'll have a wonderful day. Um, also, I want to invite you, the listening audience, if you have any questions you want to ask me, you can have my contact information is on the rolling credits at the end of the show. Um, there's a phone number, there's an email address, and there's a website. Feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Also, I am a minister. I'm also a state licensed alcohol drug abuse counselor. I do spiritual counseling. If you resonate with the, what you hear from me and you think that it might be of some help to you, I'd be happy to work with you. I don't charge standard fees. I work on a donation basis. Um, basically what uh, Alice and I have been talking about, God takes care of me, so I don't worry about the money. God provides for me at all times. I also want to let you know next week our guests are going to be a couple of three people who are going to talk about SAME, which is an energy healing process. Um, the head person is Nicola Bertolo, and we'll have a few others. I'm not sure who they're going to be. So tune in next week, and we'll actually have an on-camera demonstration. So now that I've talked myself out, do you have a parting thought? It's just lovely to be with you. And I hope it would be lovely if some of our listeners come because each person who comes brings something that no one else can bring. Uh, we love to have people drop in. It's always very enriching. Okay. And that's the message. You know, I mean, the message, well, I mean, read it again. Love one another. And I really believe, you know, these folks do that. And if you're looking for an experience and, you know, you're not satisfied, like you, know, you were talking about, you've tried some other places, you didn't feel like you fit in. 
I was thinking when you were talking about that, that old uh, Groucho Marx statement, I want no part of any <laughs> organization that will have me as its <laughs> member. You know? uh, yes. But this is one you want to be part of. <laughs> yeah, it's, anytime there's something happening down on the plaza, whether it's, you know, Veterans for Peace, whether it's a march against um, domestic violence and any of that stuff, you will always find that the friends are there, the Quakers are there with a you know, presence. We don't and get burned out because we're constantly being refilled with the living water. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a saying in 12-step, you keep what you have by giving it away. Ah, I hadn't heard and that, yeah. My own personal experience is that not only do we keep what we have by giving it away, we enhance what we have by giving it away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I look at spirituality as like a muscle. Mm -hmm. And you got to keep working on it to develop it and it gets stronger. If you let it go, it starts to atrophy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not something that we born and get a baptismal certificate or sign a contract. Spirit in its basic sense, is a dawn-going daily practice. And spirit loves us. Because we are spirit. Yes. How could spirit not love itself? Yes. And it's about but there you're talking logic. I'm sorry. <laughs> I took it back. I didn't mean to. It was an accident. <laughs> but it's, I mean, really, it, it's, it's about that. I mean, and it's walking the talk, and that's what these people do. It's not just getting together and, you know, somebody telling you sit, bow, kneel, this, that, chant this, do that. It's about letting spirit guide you and then getting out there in the community and sharing that. You know, those, those six things, peace, equality, community, truth, simplicity, and earth care. I mean, you listen to them, they all go hand in hand. You know, it's in a lot of ways, you know, it was a couple of weeks ago, we had a Tibetan Buddhist on and they were talking about the the Noble Eightfold Path. Yes. And it's very similar to this. You know, Allison and I were talking about that off camera before we started. It was like all the religions teach what Quakers teach, just most of them don't carry it out. The, the Quakers do. So give them a chance. You know, if you're not getting what you think you should be getting, you got nothing to lose. You show up one Sunday, they may not even pass the basket, it won't cost you anything. That's right. <laughs> so just give it a shot. Um, and the, the number was given, and you have it. If you need it, you can contact me. So f we're about to wrap it up. Um, I thank you all for tuning in. I thank you for listening to us, and hopefully we've challenged you to question something. You know, we're not here to convert you. Uh, just... If it isn't working, give something else a try. So until next week, know that you are God. You know, demonstrate it. Our job is not to let God in. Our job is to let God out. And treat each other with the same equal divinity as we have. And you'll be amazed what a beautiful world we'll live in. So until next week, love and light, everybody. Love and light. I'm Reverend Phil, and I've been your host for Words of the Prophets. Thank you for tuning in. Please join me again next week, same time, same channel, for more Words of the Prophets.